begin, I would like to welcome everyone to the Motion and Vision Convergence webinar. Uh, my name is Lance Brown. I'm uh, in here representing Miles Boudinier, who is the senior editor for Design World. Uh, and he's also an editor for motioncontroltips.com as well as linearmotiontips.com. Today, we are uh, going to have a couple presenters. There's going to be David uh, Cayley. Is that how you pronounce your last name? Sorry, I didn't get, catch that before. Okay, uh, uh, he's here with Om Omron Industrial Automation, and then we have Jonathan Schroeder uh, from uh, Pacific Bearing Company. Today's webinar, where uh, you can uh, tweet about it uh, using the hashtag VisionMotion, uh, if you guys want to discuss it about it on Twitter during or after, uh, as well as when you guys signed in, there is a questions tab under the GoToWebinar. You can post questions to in the GoToWebinar interface. And uh, we'll answer those questions after the presenters are done with their slides. Uh, the webinar today, we're going to cover a couple things. Today's, uh, we're going to cover today's sophisticated motion and vision systems that uh, can solve some complex automation tasks. Uh, three basic parts. Uh, there's vision components, electronic control, and mechanical components, and how these three elements combine to solve some basic motion and in inspection applications. And, uh, uh, without further ado, I'll turn the time over to uh, Jonathan as well as David. I'll let you see their screen here. Lance, just let me know when it's when they can okay. see it. Okay, and David, we have your screen, and we're good to go. Okay, great. Um, you don't see the uh, the the webinar bar, do you? No. Okay. All right. Well, welcome everyone that's on the uh, uh, this webinar conference call. Um, glad you could make it. Uh, Miles was going to uh, be on the call, but Lance is uh, standing in for him, and I'm sure that'll be fine. Uh, I am David Cayley. I work for Omron Industrial Automation as a commercial marketing manager. And the other presenter uh, is Jonathan. Um, he's with PBC Linear. John, why don't you say hi? Hi, everybody. I am the uh, business development manager, uh, mainly responsible for new product development uh, and, and this movie convergence working with Omron. Good. So today um, we're going to just, uh, well, we did our introductions, who we are. Uh, we're going to introduce movie. It is pronounced movie, not movie. Um, talk about the elements of it and a couple typical applications and some of the challenges. And then uh, from there, uh, we're actually going to go over three applications where we've had uh, motion and vision convergence. Uh, both companies, PBC Linear and Omron, have done various different uh, forms of the applications that we're uh, going to go over. And then we'll just uh, finish up with a short conclusion and a, and a Q&A session. So, talking about uh, inspection uh, historically, uh, inspection was done by a, a, a vision system. It was typically an afterthought and it was primarily uh, inspect and reject. So you might be, as in the picture here, looking at a label on a bottle, and if it's no good, it gets kicked out. But uh, today what we're seeing is uh, vision and motion really being integrated together. And we're seeing more and more vision-guided motion, and we're seeing uh, vision systems in motion as well. The, uh, <coughs> Sorry, I was having a technical glitch here, folks. There we go. So movie is just that. It's motion plus vision. It's taking vision beyond inspect and reject 
and moving it into uh, more of an inspect, move, inspect, and reject, or move, inspect, and orient, or in some cases, inspection in motion. And we're seeing it used more and more in storage and retrieval systems. This uh, motion vision convergence, it's not new, really. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, AOI, automated optical inspection, is uh, basically looking at circuit boards and wafers, that sort of thing, semiconductor wafers. You know, Omron's been doing this for 20 years. I'm pretty sure PBC's been involved in uh, some of the uh, machines that do this inspection. What kind of makes it different is these were highly, highly specialized machines. Um, and they did have a major motion component and a vision component, um, but they're not really designed for going on a standard factory line in some of the applications that we're going to share with you through this presentation. So even though we've been doing it for 20-plus 20 20 years, the way we're starting to do it now, and we're seeing this as a general industry trend, it's not just our companies, um, is pretty interesting. And there are uh, three key elements when uh, you're looking at any movie application, the first element is the motion control, which includes the controller, the I.O., the drives, the motors. Um, there's a mechanical element. Which consists of things like the actuators, uh, or if you want to do it yourself, the bearings, uh, screws, belts. Uh, linear guides, all that good stuff that uh, is neatly packaged inside a, a nice little actuator box. Uh, then you've uh, got gearboxes, couplings, sensors, cable carriers, mounting hardware, and then the final piece is the vision system. Yeah, and in the vision system, there's uh, you know there's three distinct or four distinct elements. You've got a controller, a camera a lighting system, and while not always, frequently there's an HMI involved as well. Um, different cameras and, and vision controller systems sometimes have all these elements separate uh, or um, combinations thereof. Uh, some of the camera systems will have the lighting built into the camera, uh, and some of the newer vision systems will have the uh, controller built into the camera as well. And one of the things I forgot to mention on the motion control you know, your higher end motion will have a standalone motion controller, but some of your lower end motion uh, might actually use a PLC instead of a motion controller with uh, pulse outputs and that sort of thing. There are uh, some challenges, <clears throat> some very similar challenges, um, but different challenges with each one of these uh, um, uh, <clears throat> elements. The um, speed and accuracy are, are probably the two common challenges that go across all three platforms. Then there's uh, communication between you know, visions and PL vision systems and PLCs um, the, uh, and back office systems sometimes. And then selecting the right uh, hardware. Again, selection tends to be uh, across all of the elements. And then ultimately you have software, um, maintaining software, learning how to use it and actually program. Um, there's other challenges distinct to the mechanical parts, John. Do you, yeah, do you again, again, uh, speed and accuracy play in here. The difference is that uh, speed means different things to, to different people. And same thing with accuracy, and we'll get into that in the next two slides. But uh, as David mentioned, uh, selection is also uh, a challenge here, and it can be very challenging. Uh, torque calculations uh, can be complex and confusing. Uh, then you have things you have to worry about, like the environment um, and where, um, you know, what are the wear components and uh, how is that going to affect the life of the system and performance over time. And then the, the vision system has its own unique challenges, which, David, do you want to talk about those? Well, <clears throat> you know, in the, in some of these challenges, field of view is always a, is always a challenge, and that's actually um, where we're seeing a lot more uh, motion-guided vision. Um, because rather than trying to put a camera and a lens in place that can see everything, we can just move the camera instead and um, so that we can accommodate the field of view. There's triggering, um, being able to trigger the image, take color discrimination is a, is a very uh, big challenge. Um, selection, like anything else in environment as well, um, can also be a uh, significant challenge. So let's talk about... Uh, 
the, the speed challenge. We're, we won't focus on every challenge in detail. I think, John, I, didn't we say we'd just do uh, speed and so, accuracy? Measures? Yeah, the, those two really play across for all three of them, so we'll just focus on speed and, and accuracy, and uh, I think those two will kind of explain everything. Show that. So. Okay, um, from the motion control side of it, the electronics, network data and processing speed, um, these are from a speed perspective, the motion controller has to be able to get the information about what it's, where it's moving product, um, or when, it, or where it's going to go pick up product, and it needs to be able to process and move calculations very quickly, typically uh, measured in microseconds. And uh, me being a traditional mechanical engineer, um, you know the stuff that David here talked about is electrons moving around on a circuit board, and you know. I can't really see that, so I like the things I can actually physically see, so mechanical works out pretty well for me. And on a mechanical system, we're looking at things like maximum velocity, uh, acceleration, deceleration, which are, are typically functions of, of the load that are applied and uh, the size of the motor. And, uh, can, and in this case, it's typically measured in uh, meters per second or uh, feet per second, inches per second, um, depending on which unit system you're, you're talking about. And again, that's a little bit different than the vision system, uh, which David, you want to explain uh, what speed means in terms of a vision system? Well, with, with the vision system, you, um, you've got uh, the trigger, and that's the time at, um, when the product goes by a certain point, how fast is that product moving? You know, we were talking about the meters per second. So we have to make sure that our trigger timing is right so that the product of interest is in front of the camera at the time the camera is actually taking the image. And then depending on what you're looking at, there can be a lag in the processing time um, of the uh, controller as it's trying to determine whether that product is uh, a good product or a bad product in the, in the case of a you know, inspect and reject application. In which case, again, um, we have to take into account the uh, um, cameras working in milliseconds while the uh, um, line is moving in meters per second. So if there is going to be a kickout, we have to calculate where the kickout is in relation to where the camera is so that the camera has enough time as the product's moving to process it and then say, hey, this one's got to go, and it can be kicked out. It can still kick out the right product. <coughs> and uh, talking about accuracy, the uh, accuracy, um, there's a lot of overlap here, especially with... Uh, the controller and the uh, mechanicals. Um, we talk about overshoot and hysteresis and settling time, and uh, you know, overshoot being you know where did you want the product to stop versus where it actually stopped. Um, settling time is as it's moved back to that location. How 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 long before it actually gets to where you want it? Hysteresis um, has a couple of different definitions, um, but it can have uh, it, primarily we. Uh, when I think of hysteresis, I think of it as you know the acceleration ramp, and as you go to a st stable time, there'll be a little bit of a final acceleration before it stabilizes um, out on the graph. Uh, mechanically, John? Yeah, mechanically, accuracy is uh, typically looked at in terms of a function of backlash, and backlash in the screw, backlash in the gearbox, uh, backlash in your drivetrain. Um, all of that matters. Uh, then you've got repeatability for uh, for the system. How repeatable is that system going to be when it's going back and out and forth, back and forth, the same position? Um, especially, and this is more prevalent. And if you, if your camera is going to move dynamically over a series of points to to be looked at, and then you've got the rigidity of the system. If you look at the system on on the screen now, and Typically, when we're working on designing a system like this, we work in SolidWorks or Solid Edge or Autodesk or some, you know, one of those programs. And in those programs, uh, you know, the design is infinitely stiff. But in reality, that's not exactly the case. And sometimes being off by, you know, sometimes just a few micrometers that this thing might deflect, uh, that's enough to throw your whole system off. And with accuracy, what it means to the vision system, has a lot to do with uh, the camera's ability to um, pick out the, a distinct color um, or a difference between two colors. Uh, many cameras are, are color cameras, but this can also be done in a gray scale depending on what you're looking at. Um, and you also have to have enough resolution for the controller to make a determination of you know <coughs> the product that it's looking at, whether it's good or bad, or if we're just measuring 
you know, just taking a measurement as to the size or that sort of thing. So, in reality, um, not every company does it all. I, you know, Omron does uh, motion controllers and vision, but we don't do the mechanicals like PVC Linear does. Um, a lot of companies only do one of the three disciplines, and this is kind of where we're talking about convergence um, when it comes from a, a collaboration standpoint. John, did you want to? Well, that, that really brings us into you know the, the next couple slides we get to, and collaboration is is really key. You know, it, as we all know, all of us that are listening to this call right now are in the business typically of of making something whether we're making packaging machines um, or whether we're actually using that packaging machine to uh, go ahead and sell bottled water, whatever it is. At the end of the day, we all make something. We add value to the world somehow. And it, it's tough enough to go out there and convince the world that we are a packaging machine manufacturer, we are a, uh, uh, a water bottling company, or whatever it is that we do, however we add value to the world. It's tough enough to go out there and compete against all our competitors. And what PBC Linear and Omron have realized is that there's there's no sense for PBC Linear, which uh, Pacific Bearing Company, to go, you know, to go out and convince the world that we are a motion control company uh, from the standpoint of uh, PLCs and motion controllers, or that we're a vision company. Instead, what we're doing is we're taking sort of a somewhat of a novel approach, and we are partnering with uh, a world-class company like Omron together to provide a solution to the end customer. And wh where I say it's novel, the, the idea of partnership is really something that's been around for a long time. The difference is that it's very open. If you look at the bottom of the screen, you see a PVC Linear logo, you see an Omron logo. Neither company is trying to hide behind a private label agreement or anything like that uh, with, uh, with the other. And what that leads to is we're leveraging each other's strengths to provide you, the, the end customer, with a product that uh, you know will function, it will work right, and you'll end up with a better product at, at the end of the day because Omron can focus on the electronics, which is where their strength is, and PBC Linear will focus on the mechanicals, where our strength is. And by combining our strengths, it's easier for the, comp for the customers because it allows you to go ahead and focus on what you do, what you do best and you end up with the benefits of a reduced selection time, which leads to shorter design cycles and more profitability. You get products out to market faster, which gets you cash back in your pocket faster so you can work on the next project. You have fewer technical support conflicts because there's no finger pointing between PVC and Omron. We just we take a very holistic approach where if something's not working, we'll work together to fix it and get it right for you guys. Um, on the on the electrical side, uh, because the vision system and the motion control system are made by one manufacturer, you have a common communication protocol. So you know, I'm a mechanical guy, not much of an electrical guy. I know there's uh, field bus and mod bus and all these other communication protocols. Uh, in some cases, go over my head uh, how exactly they work. But I like to think of it as they're both speaking English to each other. You don't have one speaking Chinese and the other one speaking English, and you know they they actually work and they talk and they and they communicate on the same language. Um, and then you have the vision system that can speak directly to the motion controller, uh, which provides some pretty unique benefits that we're going to talk about in uh, one of the application stories coming up. But the the sum of it is it's easier to program. There's less hardware, and it makes it easier for the ultimately for the maintenance guy at the end user to go out and troubleshoot the program because ultimately there's only one phone number to call. Well said, John. Very well said. So we're going to switch gears a little bit here. We uh, just wanted to introduce um, Movia as a concept and what it means to our two companies and what it can mean to yours. Um, now we're going to do as promised. We're going to um, share with you a couple applications that uh, um, PBC Linear has done as well as uh, Omron has uh, done and we've done a couple of these uh, in recent past together now uh, for some of our customers and the first application is a bottle inspection and the application is a line where they're filling different size bottles it might be an 8 ounce bottle at one time a 16 ounce bottle um, later in the day and then the next day they might switch over to 32 ounce bottles 
<coughs> and they're typically in this type of application. They'll be looking at both the fill level of the bottle as well as uh, verifying the integrity of the, of the cap. And one of the uh, key challenges um, in the past when this was done is the camera would be mounted literally with set screws. <coughs> and it required a, a manual adjustment um, with the set screw, which is very, very time consuming on a changeover. And as I'm sure many of you know, um, changeover time is critical. We like to shorten it as much as we can. So um, what, what companies started doing, what we started doing for companies, was taking away that set screw and going to a uh, manual crank system using some uh, um, linear guides and actuators. Um, this system uh, was better than the old set screw system, but it still had uh, significant problems. It was still time consuming and someone inaccurate. So the operator you know, turns the crank to a certain point and then they tweak it and go back and forth, look at a golden unit or something. Um, having these cranks uh, in a food and in a beverage type application required uh, some pretty significant uh, engineering work on the enclosure so that the uh, enclosure would maintain its uh, uh, integrity in the, in the wet environment. And then, of course, it took up extra space on the line. And in a lot of uh, factory situations, it seems like every square foot, maybe every square inch seems to make a difference. And this was a, a somewhat bulky solution. So uh, for the solution, John? Yeah, for the solution, uh, PVC and Omron got together, and I'm going to mainly talk about the, the mechanical solution. We'll get to the camera here in a little bit. But what we did is we basically found a miniature actuator uh, that would work with this application. Uh, the, and we're going to show you two different ones here. This, the one that you see on the screen right now in front of you is, uh, was designed for some more dynamic applications where a changeover would occur on a relatively frequent basis. Uh, probably aimed more at packaging lines uh, for uh, like a Granger or another warehouse type company where the package size frequently changes and the camera may have to actually move uh, you know every, every several times per minute. Um, if we look at the next slide, in this case with the if you want to flip to the next slide, there we go. With the uh, the bottling line where it's a relatively infrequent changeover. You know, the bottling manufacturer may run one size bottle for anywhere from uh, a couple hours to sometimes a couple days, uh, depending on their product mix. Uh, a less ex an even less expensive system uh, is really ideal. So the nice thing, again, about working with a company like PBC or uh, a company like Omron is we have different solutions that are available for depending on the type of application and the performance level needed. Uh, in this particular application, the the end the end customer was able to walk up to PLC and push a button, and the system would actually move. If we look at uh, just David, can we flip back and forth between the last two slides? Uh, if you notice that the basically the last slide and this one, the only difference between a, a short bottle and a tall bottle is that the actuator moved up and down a, a few inches to recenter itself on the the next cap size. That's, that's correct, and um, the results were uh, pretty interesting. Errors during changeover were um, reduced dramatically uh, in the application that I'm referencing. Uh, so they weren't getting uh, rejects um, just because a camera was misplaced. Uh, changeover time was you know, probably in the 10, 12 minute time frame by automating it. It went down to uh, roughly a minute, maybe even a little bit less. Uh, getting the uh, cranks out of the enclosure for the camera uh, stopped water ingress. Um, the customer was uh, realizing um, moisture-related failures um, and, uh, just because of enclosure integrity. And the enclosure was significantly smaller, uh, as well as the parts count uh, being reduced by as much as 40%. So sure, there was an added expense in the motor and the actuator and that sort of thing, but it was really offset because the total parts count went down as well as the um, amount of sheet metal being used uh, for the enclosure. Right, and, and the changeover time going from a 10-minute changeover between every changeover going down to less than a minute uh, 
significant. It was a, a pretty significant savings because the this customer had multiple cameras through their process line, so it wasn't just a a single ten minute instance. It was several ten minute instances uh, was changed to just walking up to a PLC, pushing a button, and waiting you know for a few seconds for uh, for everything to to change over. Yeah, <clears throat> that's correct. In the uh, image that you should be seeing now. Um, we were using uh, um, images that were somewhat demonstrative of, uh, of a very simple system. This system is a little more complicated. Um, it's going up and down and forward and back, and it's actually got two cameras instead of one camera on it. And this was an actual uh, application for one of our customers as well. Right. And Dave, we've also seen instances where we, you, um, when you have to read a barcode on a, a bottle, as it's coming down the line because you don't know where that, that barcode is going to be. We've seen some customers do a very similar setup where you have a camera on both, this exact setup on both sides of the line. So sometimes uh, four cameras is what ends up being required, depending on the, the needs of the actual application. That, that is correct. So let's, uh, let's move on to the uh, next application. And that application is uh, inspection in motion. And what we have here is a, it's a, it's a lab situation where they're growing uh, cultures. Um, this is actually at a university. Uh, interestingly enough, when John and I sat down to talk about the applications, both our companies had independently done something similar. Um, so we, we combined the, our learning and uh, decided to talk about this. Um, the uh, application needed to look at these cultures and petri dishes um, date and time stamp, take a look at color, measure physical size, and uh, um, measure change from the last inspection. There's a illustration of a culture. I think that's actually a drawing. Oh, it was, I was just told it's real. <laughs> um, here's the problems with this. It was a very manual process. They were literally um, going to the different di petri dishes, looking at what you saw there. Um, and having human interaction take a picture at one hour increments, um, do manual measurements, which is very subjective um, and can vary from one person to the next how they're, how they're actually measuring the size and colors. And then the uh, image logging, they wanted to be able to log everything. Uh, again, a very manual process. Somebody had to download the pictures into a computer, make sure everything was date and time stamped properly. Um, and we, and identified as to the exact location and an exact dish that uh, the image was coming from. The solution, I think I'll let John tell you how the solution went. Uh, the, the solution from a mechanical standpoint was a very, it was a relatively simple uh, XY gantry system or Cartesian robot. Uh, again, it can be scalable depending on how large of an application we need. Uh, but in this case, it's a relatively small lab environment where you're you're only about a one inch, uh, sorry, one foot deep by maybe about two feet long, uh, in order to fit in enough petri dishes in. And then there's a, a camera system. Um, I believe it's a FZ Vision system was applied, and that FZ Vision system is able to actually go ahead and uh, measure uh, the actual sample. Um, I believe on the Dave, let's go to the I believe the next slide. Sure. And so what the, what the camera is actually looking at is, is the motion controller takes the camera to one of the dishes, and then the camera is taking a look at the color of the culture and also giving an exact measurement of the size so that we can track growth of the culture um, in very exacting standards. And if for some reason, like what you see here, it, the camera cannot see the entire culture at, at its current field of view, it can actually send the message back to the controller and, and ask the controller to move it so that it can take two images and do the, uh, the compare from there. Right. So as a result of this, um, automating the entire system, uh, first and foremost, it eliminated needing 24-hour staff on all the time. I mean, there's a huge labor savings uh, for the uh, university that was doing this. Um, the auto measurement of the culture size and the color, uh, very, very accurate, so they were able to glean growth rates um, and, and or, you know, uh, failure rates for whatever they're trying to grow. I'm not a 
biochemist type person, so I don't know too much about what they're looking at. But uh, <coughs> another important thing is the camera is able to automatically log the images um, and not only you know give the date and timestamp, but also automatically log with it the uh, location of where that image came from, which, as you can imagine, reduced uh, data entry errors dramatically. And you know, that was uh, kind of a lab situation, and you go, well, you know, how many times am I doing a lab situation? We've done essentially the exact same thing in a sawmill. Uh, and we were taking a look at the uh, texture and quality of the wood on these boards, and the camera was, again, on a gantry system, and it would uh, go back and forth, um, taking a look for, you know, looking for bad knots or chunks out of the, out of the boards, as well as uh, ensuring the uh, texture was the appropriate depth um, in, into the board. So just it, kind of demonstrating their scalability. Yeah, and interestingly enough, when working with this manufacturer, uh, originally they were trying to um, grade their planks into grades, uh, into like an A through F classification system where A was the best and had no knots in it, and F was uh, too knotty to use. What they actually found is that they could sell the product as your, your A and B grade, your planks, but then the planks that were F grade, um, not not not, or they had too many knots in them, they turned around and sold them as a uh, you know knotty cedar or knotty pine, and they sold those at a premium. So what what originally turned into they were trying to uh, inspect for scrap turned into be a profit center for them as well. So that was a uh, a good classification. Great. All right, so now we're going to go into uh, the third and final application. And this is automated storage and retrieval systems. Um, everybody is probably familiar with this on one level or another. Um, in this application, it was an uh, automated uh, pharmaceutical dispensing system. And the uh, system needed to be able to, the, ro the robot needed to be able to go grab the bottle and take an image of the barcode that's on the bottle. Um, as well as uh, inspect after the uh, bottle is labeled. One of the problems uh, was really mechanical in nature. John, you can probably uh... Ab absolutely, and you know, really the biggest problem of this company faced that we when we were working with them is incorrect dispensing was a major liability. It was uh, viewed as a what they called a, a sink the ship uh, type liability, where you know if you incorrectly dispense a med uh, medication to a, a patient that has a, a negative interaction or reaction, uh, you could literally kill somebody. And as we all know, um, the, only pure, the only thing that positive that happens when that happens is lawyers get rich and companies go out of business. So it, the company we were working with in order to uh, come up with a solution, they were faced with some serious comp uh, problems where they had designed up a relatively inexpensive, you know, and that's the goal, we all want the least expensive system, uh, but they had designed up a relatively inexpensive uh, weldment frame. And then inside of that weldment, uh, pretty much everything else is made out of sheet metal, uh, which sheet metal is great, it's, it's a low cost, but anybody on the call that's worked with sheet metal knows that there's usually some tolerance stack up issues. And uh, this particular company that we're working with, um, you know, shims were used f very frequently to try and get everything to line up, and uh, the assembly time was very intensive. Um, so, with the pr the solution that PBC and Omron uh, came forth with, uh, actually allowed the customer to get rid of all their shims uh, and significantly reduce the the, the assembly and. Uh, David, let's go ahead and, and look at the next slide and talk about that solution and, and talk about what we came up with. Okay. Uh, essentially so the solution um, was another gantry system or Cartesian robot. Um, and this system uh, um, deployed a home sensor so that it knew roughly where it was. Uh, and the, and the, big, the big thing here is normally when you do a robot, all the sensors are mounted on the robot. And what we proposed to the customer uh, that they thought was fairly novel was we took the home position sensor off of the robot and we actually put it on the sheet metal frame inside their machine. So uh, as this customer is building several of these machines, uh, one of the challenges was trying to get that Cartesian robot to line up with the sheet metal frame. 
and by putting the home sensor on the frame or inside the machine and off of the robot, it actually helped that alignment uh, because now you have a, an ordinate position that is in the essentially home position of the, um, of the sheet metal storage rack for all the medicine. So, oh. and, and, and what would happen is when the uh, patient would walk up to, to the machine and say that they want uh, Tylenol with codeine or whatever it is dispensed, the robot would move to where it thought it was that medicine was supposed to be stored. But because of the tolerance stack up that was in all that sheet metal, uh, frequently the robot would try and pick uh, the medicine and it would either mispick or would miss by enough that uh, it just wouldn't work. And David, you want to talk about the the vision system and some of the things that uh, the vision system? Sure. sure. What the, well, what the camera would do is actually um, the robot would get the camera to near the product enough so that it was in the camera's field of view. And the first thing the camera would do is take a look at the barcode, read it, and verify that that is the uh, um, product, the medicine that they that needed to be picked. And then uh, the camera would tell the uh, um, robot. Uh, basically send it offset move coordinates so that the robot was guaranteed to pick the exact uh, uh, medicine that needed picking. So the camera, at first the robot's bringing the camera to the product and it's being verified, but then the camera is telling the robot, okay, here's exactly where you need to go to pick this product effectively. And this, of course, would you know reduce uh, um, bad, bad picks. And ultimately, um, they went ahead and used the uh, camera for two final things, and that was to, uh, there would be a label automatically put on for the uh, prescription for the individual, and then the camera would look to ensure that that label was properly placed in there, and it would store an image of that into um, a database, you know, for liability reasons, of course. Right. Yeah, and one of the things that we had also proposed, the, the picture on the screen now is just kind of a representative sample of uh, how the system works. Um, but one of the things we had also proposed to the to the uh, to the device manufacturer, the vending machine manufacturer, is that for places where there's actual actually a pill, is that if we could change the packaging somehow so that the camera could actually see that there is a um, you know what the pill shape is. Now, uh, if you see the pill shape, the color and the number written on the pill, you can identify that because all that's unique and, and logged with, uh, I believe, the FDA. Um, so the, this, in this case, the device manufacturer not, decided not to go with that, but that was one additional benefit that we thought um, was, was a possibility that, you know, maybe in a future device they'll, they'll decide to add that feature. Sure. So as a result, um, they reduced uh, uh, the amount of... Uh, um, staff required as, for the pharmacy, um, which, you know, pharmacists don't come cheap, and so if you can reduce one or two heads, you know, for, on a somewhat regular basis, um, your return on investment will come back to you fairly quick. Um, the, the vision system's ability to do the edge detection and calculate the offset moves, uh, reduce the assembly tolerances, and reduce the assembly cost for this machine. Um, and, and ultimately having the uh, vision system on there um, lowered the uh, customer's uh, levels of liability, which is the most important thing in this situation. So we talked about uh, pharmaceutical application um, dispensing, but you know we've seen other storage and retrieval systems. We've worked on them. Uh, this one on the right of the screen that you're seeing right now is a high base storage, and these are unmanned. Uh, the robots go up and down the aisle and up and down uh, in this particular application I think it's 30 30 rows high and it uses it's basically the same thing it uses a camera to auto locate uh, it uses sensors and homing sensors and this that and another but at the final move to pick a pallet off it's actually taking a look to guarantee to tell the motion system the final position of that pallet so that we don't have uh, a pallet being dropped um, and what you're seeing on the left is something that uh, we've um, started working on. This is going in on the West Coast. It's, a, uh, it's an automated um, parking system for cars. Uh, it's the same idea. Um, the cars go on a pallet and get put away. Uh, it reduces the building space um, and
and it makes uh, storage and retrieval of the cars faster than having people run up and down, you know, staircases to go get the cars. So a couple more real-world applications that uh, we've been involved in. So gotta, we've got to have enough time for the Q&A part of this. Um, my audience feed just went to, that's interesting. So just in summary, you know, we talked about uh, the three key elements, the motion control element, the mechanical element, and the vision element. Um, we talked about the controllers, the actuators, and the gearboxes, um, the cameras, and we kind of went through some of the challenges that each of these uh, have. These challenges being speed and accuracy, number one, the uh, color discrimination, being able to communicate back and forth, environmental concerns, um, selection was a real big deal, being able to select the right products, uh, that sort of thing. And what we uh, what we discovered is, you know, we talked to, we referred to all of this as convergence between PVC linear and Ohm run industrial automation. Ultimately, as, as a customer, you know, convergence doesn't mean anything unless you get some significant benefit out of it. And the benefits um, from a communication standpoint, faster machines. Uh, from a selection standpoint, it's faster design. Um, from a tech support st standpoint, you know, you have less wasted time uh, having he said, she said tech support groups from different companies that don't work together. And uh, having cameras that are actually hanging on the network now uh, reduces the hardware costs because you don't have to run through a uh, PLC to uh, interpret what the camera's saying, which is a pretty common way of doing it. And if we get our way, John and I were kind of hoping to uh, do another one of these in a couple of months. And we're going to change it from movie to movies, and we're going to include the safety component. Hopefully, uh, this was valuable to uh, some of the viewers online. And if it is, we'll put together another one, and we'll talk about the convergence of motion, vision, and safety, both from the electronics and the mechanical standpoints. So that actually uh, leads us to the end. I'm just waiting for this slide to load on your screens. It actually says questions. Uh, we have a little bit of time for um, questions from the audience. Uh, I think maybe some of them have already come in. Um, Lance, I, I, I believe you have a view on that. I don't have a view on any of the questions. Yeah, I have the view here. Uh, Miles has been trying to get in. I'm going to quickly see if he's here. Uh, Miles, are you here? Can you speak? It uh, doesn't look like uh, Miles is here. So, uh, yeah, I have the questions here. Uh, first one I have, uh, uh, what is a, uh, is Movie a software package, a hardware package product, or is it just a concept? Movie is more of a, uh, a concept, although I did put together, um, and it will be being released, um, kind of like a starter uh, system, which would include uh, a motion controller and a camera, um, the ones that are designed to work together. Um, we are evaluating if we can include some uh, um, mechanical hardware into that as well. So while it's primarily a concept, um, it, it is a little beyond the concept. We will have actual product um, that, you know, people can purchase um, kind of in a bundled solution. Sure. And our, our intention here is, because not every application is the same, uh, we want to go ahead and actually uh, say that we're going to tie these components together, is that these are the ones that I work ideally together. So if you're doing a packaging line, here's a camera you probably, probably want, here's the motion control you probably want, here's the mechanical solution you probably want. And yes, we guarantee that all three of these are going to work together. Yes. Okay, uh, so another one is, a, could you uh, provide a kind of a general definition of backlash? Uh, sure, and there's two definitions, and uh, I've got to rely a little bit on, uh, from, from going from a mechanical standpoint, um, there's, a, there's a gear train, and if anybody's ever, um, I don't know, sometimes you see it on your watches, um, or if anybody's ever run a machine tool, or play with Legos or Rector sets or any of that kind of stuff. When you're turning something in one direction, um, at some point you stop 
and you want to go back the other way. When you go start going back the other way, you start turning back the other way, there's a little bit of space where, a little bit of rotational space, I guess, where you turn the handle and nothing happens. Um, and that's kind of one definition of backlash. Um, another definition, uh, sometimes on le a less expensive uh, linear motion systems with screws or belts, you can, when the system's actually stationary, you can actually push the, the carriage back and forth a little bit. Um, and that little bit of play or slap is, uh, can be referred to as backlash as well. I, I hope that answers the question. It was clear enough. Okay, sure. Uh, is there an easy way to, uh, for mounting cameras on mechanical device, devices, and is there a guide to select these components? That's another excellent uh, question and, and component um, part of this whole movie concept. Uh, we know that uh, working together, that we're like there's a, a few. Elmore has a few cameras. PBC has a few so, um, linear stages, and uh, part of this concept is we will have uh, mounting kits that will be readily available. So if you're using camera A and actuator A, then you want um, bracket A. If you're using actuator B and camera B, then you want bracket B. So that hardware will be readily available um, uh, for, for you guys to use. OK. Um, can vision systems withstand the vibration of feeder bowls? Alex Novak, he's a commercial engineer for Omron, and I'm going to ask Alex to take that question. <laughs> Typically, a camera isn't put in, you know, in sync with a uh, uh, feeder bowl. It's a stationary element, and it's shattering the camera, shattering at a high enough rate of speed to um, stop the motion and process of what it's inspecting. So, no, you usually do not mount a camera on a vibratory feeder bowl. But you can go ahead and mount it on a piece of 8020 that's mounted next to the feeder bowl that uh, captures images as it's coming out of the feeder bowl. Correct. Yep. Okay. Uh, next question: uh, Do you use hardware or software triggers uh, to capture vision data, and what are the advantages of using a hardware trigger versus a software trigger? Hardware trigger allows for. Uh, placement of the product in sync with a light that's on the object itself. Uh, a software trigger would be, as an example, um, uh, continuous inspection or um, relative placement based on a previous inspection. So in the case of um, uh, presence or absence of a product, whether you continue on with, with an inspection. So. Um, I hope that outlines the advantages of each. You know, one, you know, you're you're doing a critical inspection where light comes into play, and if light um, is behind or ahead of an object, then you're not going to inspect it correctly. So, a fixed trigger or um, uh, a continuous trigger, or you know, a software trigger where light or you know the inspection isn't um, critical. Yeah, uh, let me take this also from a kind of a mechanical standpoint. Something I've seen done is when the camera is relatively stationary and the, and the object is pa passing through it, let's say on a, um, a bottle cap inspection, like in the application we talked about before, um, you could put a sensor and as the product passes through or right before that, it, it trips a sensor and that's more of a, a hardware, tri hardware um, trip. Whereas on some the other applications we talked about, like the lab automation one where the camera is moving, you'll have PLC move to a certain location and the PLC or the motion controller will send a signal to the camera or your software trigger to say, take a picture now. So uh, kind of another gen more general rule possibly is that if the camera is moving attached to a, a motion system, likely it's going to be a software trigger. And if the camera is semi-stationary uh, and product is passing through it, a hardware trigger would also be beneficial. OK. Uh, next question is, uh, for the different size of the bottle, the movie with the servo was controlled by PLC? Uh, it can be controlled by the, the me mechanical system. In that case, could be controlled by a, a number of different options. It can be controlled by a PLC. It can be controlled by a motion controller. Um, and in some cases, in a, uh, in, uh, a less demanding application, 
You can even get a, a stepper motor that has a built-in controller to it, uh, where you're only moving back and forth between, say, a, a very few, you know, a limited number of positions. Uh, with infrequent movement, a uh, stepper motor would work well for that. And, and Jonathan's absolutely right. Um, we've seen this application done pretty much all three different ways. Um, everything from um, servo based down to stepper motors. Uh, typically you're going to not dedicate a motion controller to that. Um, you'll already have a motion controller on the machine and it, it'll just be, it'll take that as a task, as an added task. Mm -hmm. Whereas a, a machine controller somewhere on the line here is already likely to have a PLC. You can have it feed a step and direction a pulse train out to a stepper motor drive uh, that, and telling it to uh, to go home and then to move to a certain position. Okay. Uh, another question is, if someone is inter interested in this, how does Omron or PBC Linear take the lead? Uh, who does the customer interface with? Uh, whoever they want to. Yeah. Um, with, it's you know if you're already talking to PBC or you're already talking to Omron, then continue um, continue working together with uh, the person who you're you're used to working with. And if you're not, then on, you know on the screen right now is uh, two websites and two one eight hundred numbers uh, and two email addresses. So you can pick any one of those uh, six options and, you know, whatever you're most comfortable with, picking up the phone, sending an email, or going to a website, you can do any one of those, uh, those three options. And uh, generally what we've done in the past is depending on how, um, let's say, tough your application is, um, PVC Linear has people that are trained on motion control selection and on camera selection and Omron has people that are trained on uh, mechanical system selection. And depending on how tough the application is, if it's, uh, you know, let's say a relatively simple application, then uh, we can go ahead and get you the right product selected. And if it's not, uh, we'll take a more collaborative approach. Yes, definitely. Uh, a question is, uh, petri dish, uh, the Petri dish system, how do you handle the overhang torque of the XY system holding the camera? It looks like it might affect the accuracy. Again, going back to kind of accuracy and, and repeatability, in this particular application, all the customer is worried about is repeatability. And all that's necessary is that when that uh, camera gets out to the right place, it, it repeats to the same position. And in this case, what we're able to do is, is actually able to accomplish that. Uh, the weight of the camera is uh, fairly insignificant. And, it, you know, the weight of the camera and the cables and everything else that's actually attached to this application is down around, I think it was like either 2 or 5 percent of the total capacity of the system. So for that part, we end up with actually a fairly rigid system because we're using such a small percentage of the total capacity. So even though it may, in the, in the picture may look, make it look like it, uh, it may bounce around or move around or things like that, in reality, um, in this particular application, it, it didn't do any of that. Yeah. Uh, okay. Customers with uh, the need of movie applications and need to store images uh, and exchange data with databases, uh, in the past it says they've had some limitation with vision systems. Uh, uh, what is the capability that uh, uh, we can offer about it? I'm assuming it has to deal with uh, you know, moving frames instead of still frames. Yeah, go ahead, Alex. We have a dedicated uh, a processor that a dedicated controller that actually has two processors, so we can the second processor can actually take the image and the data and store it over a network drive while the inspection is being performed on the other processor. Okay. So no, and it's communicating over Ethernet, right? Communicating over Ethernet. So you know, the old days you had to save it on a you know some type of memory file and then extract that data at a later time. Now it's dynamic. As the inspection is occurring, we can offload that information. Okay, uh, we've got about three minutes left uh, just to answer a few, couple more questions. Uh, quick one, has Omron used their cameras in high heat applications? And if yes, what are the temperature ranges? 
another one for Alex. <laughs> Any high heat application we've done, the camera enclosure has been cooled um, because you hit a certain um, temperature range for the, for the electronic components in the device itself. So we have done some high heat applications with uh, enclosures where the enclosure has been cooled. Okay. Uh, we'll just go, go ahead and uh, close up with this question. Is, um, uh, how accurate can be motion position correction with a vision system feedback? Uh, millimeters or micrometers? That depends upon the resolution of the camera. Uh, we can, with a high magnification lens and with a uh, higher format CCD array, we can um, come down into the micrometer range. Okay. Uh, well, thank you, uh, John and Dave, for your time. If uh, anyone didn't have their questions answered, uh, feel free to email either John or David at uh, their emails. It's showing here on the screen. Uh, we thank everyone for coming, and we hope you have a very nice day. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, thank you, everybody.